Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Whiskey Wednesday webcast from Whiskey Cast. I'm Mark Gillespie in the Whiskey Cast studio in New Jersey. Hope you've had a good week so far. It has been a busy one. We've had a lot of new releases announced this week and uh, a major announcement today out of Lynchburg, Tennessee, where Chris Fletcher was named the eighth master distiller in Jack Daniels history at a news conference online this morning at 11 o'clock. We have uh, complete uh, coverage at the WhiskeyCast website, whiskeycast.com, along with audio from the news conference. What we don't have right now is Chris Fletcher, who is... Uh, supposed to be joining us any second now to uh, for one of his first interviews, and we're waiting for him to uh, connect in. But uh, this is what's known as vamping a little bit and trying to fill a little bit. Still got to start at the top of the hour. Can't delay the webcast. We will also be talking about independent bottlings and working as a couple with uh, three or, well, sh I should say two and a half couples. Uh, Greg and Kirsty Dillon of Great Drams in Scotland will be joining us, or at least Greg will, because uh, Kirsty is a bit under the weather. And we will also be joined by Kate and Mark Watt, two veterans of the Scotch whiskey industry. You probably might have met Kate in her work for Springbank and Glenn Farkless over the years. And you probably know Mark from his work with Caden Heads as well. They have now formed their own independent bottling company, Watt Whiskey, with their first whiskeys that are just out. And just to bring an American flavor into this, we'll be joined by Adam Polanski and Nora Ganley Roper of Lost Lantern Whiskey, which will have its first release next week. They're going a little different. They are releasing a blended malt with whiskey from six different American malt whiskey distilleries. It'll be a blended malt under the Lost Lantern label, and we will uh, see how that goes. For them, we'll be hoping to talk to all of them. We're waiting for all of them to connect in. Greg is connected in right now, and uh, let's just go ahead and uh, start with Greg while we're waiting for everybody else to connect in. Greg, how are you tonight? Are we, hang on a second here, you are muted. Uh -huh. There we go. How are you, can, we can hear you now. Okay, I'm sorry, Greg, go ahead. <laughs> Apologies, <clears throat> new error. How are you tonight? Uh, I'm doing very well, thank you, sir. How's things your side of the pond? We yeah, are doing very well. Bad. We appear to be having a bit of an echo here. Uh, Greg, I want you to disconnect and then reconnect in, if that's okay. Uh, refresh your browser, and we'll see if we can get the sync on this, because uh, you're freezing up, and we're having some issues here. So let's uh, have you reconnect in. Now, um, let's uh, start getting some of the comments in here. And, you know, you can comment anytime during all of this. Uh, Tabitha Adams. Hi, Dram fam. I like that a lot better than the cast kids or whatever it was you guys all came up with for yourselves the other day. Uh, you can comment on YouTube, Facebook, and Periscope. Don't comment on the Twitter feed because we won't see that until after the show. From Pete Head, evening all you usual suspects. Bob Wedding, good evening, morning, or afternoon, or whatever is appropriate in your time zone. SM Rhett Pekka, and I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but good evening all. Pete Head, evening, Mark. Donner Pass Whiskey, hi, everyone. Pete Head asking, what's in everyone's glass? Well, we have a uh, Talisker 30. We have an Aerolite Lindsay. An old particular Blair Athol, 22-year-old, a 56.1%. That sounds good. Uh, Tabitha Adams, Kalila 12. And as Pete Head points out, the Aerolite Lindsay is also peated. Alan Brody, afternoon, malt heads. Matt has a 77 Glen Grant Sherry Wood in his glass. Sounds wonderful. Excuse me, didn't want to cough in your ear. Let's bring Greg back in. Greg, can you hear me now? I can indeed. Can you hear me? That's the question. That's thing. the good question. Good. So we are back up at normal now. Let's talk about how... And... Sm Okay, you're, you're going to make me actually do this, aren't you? Um, spell it out for me, because accept terms. Okay, he said spell it backwards, read it in reverse. Oy vey. it's one of those days. So, Greg, tell me how, first of all, let's explain. Kirsty's not feeling great, so she's not going to join us. So, uh, tell us a bit about Great Drams. Yeah, so Great Drams was uh, founded uh, by myself about seven years ago, I believe. Um, as a humble whiskey blog, 
um, initially with three viewers, myself, my wife, and my father-in-law. And that's now grown to um, actually 35,000 readers a month on the website. Um, led to me publishing my book on Scotch whiskey called The Great Drams of Scotland. And then Kirsty actually said to me, you know, you've got a book now, why don't you have your own whiskey? So we thought, hey, let's do this, it'll be quite fun. And so we launched the first one, had so much fun doing it, uh, that we then ended up, uh, Kirsty joining the company, and we set up our independent bottling program. It's great fun. And now we're about four years in, it's awesome. We've now been joined by Adam Polanski and uh, Nora Ganley Roper. Hi guys, how are you tonight? We're I'm, great. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulties there. How are you doing? No problem. We uh, wanted to welcome you guys in. Uh, so we just had Greg telling us a bit about the origins of Great Drams. Go ahead and finish up that story, Greg. Yeah, just saying we've four, uh, yeah, about four years in uh, to releasing our independent bottling of Scotch whiskey. And now we have a range that spans grain, blended scotch, all the blends created by myself personally, blended malt, uh, single cask, uh, single malt, and even a delightful new 30-year-old, which I believe you tried the other day, Mark. Yes, I did. Yeah, and I, I believe bottles of that, so it's a pretty special one. I am going to re-invite folks because um, just a split second here, because I'm Nora and Adam. You guys said that there was a, a slight error when you tried to log in, so I'm going to resend this link out to folks just to make sure that everybody gets it, um, because that may be part of the problem why folks haven't jumped in. Yeah, the folks from Watt Whiskey were with us on whatever other chat we were on. Aha, uh -huh. okay. We would never ditch you, Mark. I know you wouldn't, but uh, trying to figure out what happened here. I love it when things come together as a plan. Sorry about <laughs> that. So, Nora, Adam, tell us about the, the genesis of Lost Lantern. You're releasing your first whiskey next week, and I know... Um, Adam, we talked about this uh, last year when I ran into you at Julio's uh, over a year ago. So tell us about uh, the foundation of Lost Lantern. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so I used to be a senior whiskey specialist at Whiskey Advocate Magazine. Nora's background is uh, actually in wine and spirits retail. She worked at Astor Wines in New York. Um, and I was actually writing a story about Scotch independent bottlers. And at the same time, Yay. Yay. <laughs> oh, and we're joined by Kate and Mark now. Sorry about, Sorry that, about guys. that, guys. That's all right. We're here now. Okay, we are getting an echo a little bit. Okay, it appears to have gone away. <laughs> so, because I just could hear myself back in your speakers for a second there. So we're good now. So Adam, Nora, please continue. Yeah, so I was uh, I was working on a story for Whiskey Advocate about Scotch independent bottlers, which I had become really interested in. And at the same time, I was writing a feature about uh, American craft whiskey. Um, and started to think, why has no one ever done this with American whiskey? There are 2,000 2, distilleries around the country now. A lot of them are not very widely distributed or they're pretty small, and it's hard for any one person to discover all of them. And we ultimately decided that this was a great way to uh, introduce some of those whiskeys to a wider audience. And just like Scotch IBs show off really cool single barrels and expressions and bring new flavors together and blend. So I went to Nora, who also is one of our tasters, and has more of a business background, and we uh, kick things off with an eight-month road trip around the country to visit distilleries. Um, so we decided early on we'll only ever work with places we visited in person, and we wanted to really see how they were making whiskey. And it's, it's, there's so many different styles in American whiskey that um, that kick things off, and we're about to release our first uh, first blend next week. Okay, I'm going to interrupt you because we've now been joined by Chris Fletcher, the new brand new master distiller for Jack Daniels. Congratulations, Chris. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks for having and, me. And I know you've only got a few minutes to spend with us because you, so we're going to jump in. We'll talk to you real quickly and then we'll get back to the panel in just a minute if that's okay with everybody. Sounds so uh, sit tight while we talk with Chris for a second here. So Chris, uh, whoops, wrong one. <laughs> well, we're juggling pictures here and two guys with beards. You, lovely. It's one of those days. So Chris, good looking guys. tell me about the job. Tell me what, uh, you have uh, had some fun with this one over the years working with Jeff at, uh, and Jeff Arnett, who stepped down a month ago. Let's talk about this now, because uh, you did not really expect to have an eye on this job for a while, right? No, I didn't. Um, 
you know, I, working for Jeff was, was, um, you know, it's, it, you know, it, it sounds kind of, um, a little cliche, but it's just true. You know, he and I are just really good friends. Uh, and, you know, I, I talk to him, you know, all the time and, um, you know, whether that was a year ago or, or today, um, you know, that hasn't changed. And, um, uh, to say that I was surprised is probably an understatement. Uh, I didn't, didn't, uh, realize, uh, at all, or didn't, didn't see it coming. Um, you know, he, he had done so many great things in the role, um, you know, and, uh, he had just, had always kind of been that constant in, in these last six years that, that I've been here, you know, as his assistant master distiller. And, um, you, you know, there was just, I think a level of comfort between us and everything. And, um, uh, I was, I was really surprised, but, you know, I wish him well, you know, he, he, he did great things here in Lynchburg and was such a great representative for our brand and great distiller. And, um, I'm just lucky to have been able to work for him for six years. Now your history goes literally all the way back to birth because you were pretty much born into the distillery family. Your grandfather was, uh, Frank Bobo, the longtime master distiller. And tell us about growing up at the distillery with your granddad running the place. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people you see born and raised in Lynchburg. Well, I wasn't actually born in Lynchburg. There's no hospitals in Lynchburg, uh, as you know, <laughs> but, uh, in fact, uh, you know, I don't know that we have a true doctor's office in Lynchburg. We're so small. Um, but I was born, you know, just about an hour from here. Uh, but my parents are from Lynchburg. My grandparents are from Lynchburg. Um, some of my great grandparents are from Lynchburg. And so, um, as you can tell, it's pretty generational here. And that's, that's not that uncommon for, you know, folks that, that work here. I, yeah. That's a great picture of me and my grandfather there. Uh, thanks for sharing that. That's one of my all time favorites. Um, but, uh, you know, growing up, you know, in the eighties, uh, you know, my grandfather was, you know, certainly, you know, getting into the latter stages of his career here as distiller. And, um, you know, there were times, especially on Sunday afternoons a lot, you know, um, uh, you know, that was when I could kind of tag along and, I can remember him, you know, pouring into the lane here, the hollow at the distillery and just kind of, you know, giving a little wave to the security guard, you know, who may or may not have even been looking. I don't know, <laughs> but it would drive up. And, and you know, I remember, um, you know, that even though I was young and even though I didn't know what whiskey even was, certainly didn't understand uh, what Jack Daniels was as a brand. Um I knew there was something special about this place. And I think when people come here and they take our tour and they walk through, um, you know, it really has a feeling to it. You know, the cave spring, um, the history of it. And, um, you know, it was just a special place. Um, this is the best way to describe it. And uh, it's, it's really awesome to be able to, to be in this role now as, as master distiller here at Jack Daniels and, and this, this is my grandfather's old office uh, here that, that I was able to get. Uh, we, we, we've renovated a little bit uh, over the years, but uh, they even kept my old desk. You know, that's one thing. When I, when I came back home in 2014, uh, Jeff uh, said, you know, Chris, we've got this old desk that, you know, that I know Jimmy used. And I think, you know, your grandfather used it too before Jimmy. And so um, they saved it for me. You know, a lot of people want new office furniture, but I'm never going to change mine. What's the first thing you're going to do? You've done a lot of work with the uh, Tennessee Tasters selection, the uh, single barrels. You were involved in working with Jeff on creating the Jack Daniels Tennessee Rye. Where do you take the distillery from here? Because uh, this job usually has a pretty long run to it. Jeff's about the shortest tenure anybody's had at 12 years. Yeah, one, one of the short, second shortest, maybe something like that. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of things that I'm excited about here. And I, you know, I, I really think of it, you know, from beginning to end and really the entire process and what encompasses it, um, you know, all the way from grains, um, you know, what can we do there and, and grain bills. And I, I truly believe our mashing yeasting techniques, um, you know, are certainly the most traditional that I've ever been around um, and really, really proud of of our whiskey makers over in the distillery, you know, that are that are overseeing that part of the process you know, all the way through maturation, our most recent Tennessee tasters you, that you uh, just just mentioned, um, it's out there. We, we actually were able to source some wood from Jamaica 
um, and that we inserted um, a few pounds of, of Jamaican allspice wood or commonly referred to as pimento wood. Um, however, I didn't want to put pimento on the label because here in Tennessee, everybody would think it was cheese. <laughs> so we went with Jamaican allspice, which actually is a very good description of the flavor. There's this really nice kind of sweet, savory, spicy note, almost clove-like um, that really, really pushes the flavor of our whiskey. Um, you know, you're going to, you're going to see us continue to listen to the market and listen to our friends that love our whiskeys that, um, that we've, we've gotten such great feedback on things like our heritage barrel, uh, release, you know, under the single barrel special release line. Um, you know, we've listened to the Tennessee tasters and gotten feedback here locally around, um, you know, some of the favorites and things that we've done there. And so, you know, trust me, I, I take a lot of notes. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very detailed. You know, it's a little bit of the, the geekiness that comes out into me. And uh, we're going to take all that into consideration. And over the next few years, as you know, it, you know, you can't make a new whiskey in six months or um, heck, sometimes not even six years. So, um, you know, we're, we're going to continue to push and listen to folks and, and friends of, of our brand around the world and hopefully continue to surprise and give them opportunities to try new things. I know that your great, your grandfather, Frank Bobo passed away back in January, but as we saw in that picture, I know he got to see you as assistant master distiller, and I know he'd be really proud of you today, but uh, what advice did he give you about distilling? Oh gosh. Um, you know, I don't know how much time we have here this afternoon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, you know, I I could talk about so many things, uh, Mark, you know, just around kind of the importance of things, the way that they did it uh, when he started and the things that I think under, you know, his, with his 30 plus years experience in the distillery, 23 as master distiller, um, you know, there's not many things that he didn't see, <laughs> not many problems that he, you know, that he didn't experience with that kind of career. And you look at, you know, he started at 37 years old um, he, in 1966, right during the, the, the middle of our allocation when old number seven was basically the only whiskey we were putting out. And it was heavily allocated to every state in the country. We didn't export not even a drop anywhere. And, and that lasted until about 1980. And, and so nearly his entire career, I, I just can't imagine the, the pressure, you know, that he and his team were facing to, you know, recreate the same flavor day in and day out, make more and more and more, expand, 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 um, you know, all the while staying true to this process. And, you know, we're able to enjoy now as as whiskey makers here and our team of whiskey makers here in Lynchburg, we're able to enjoy the, the capabilities and, and the processes and the traditions of doing things um, in our, you know, I mentioned mashing, yeasting, but all the way through, I mean, all of our stills are 100% copper, um, you know, the mellowing techniques, 10 feet, very slow process, you know, very intensive um, you know, all the, the barrel making from scratch and sourcing our, our own oak um, through our own stave mills all the way through the cooperage process. You know, all of these things that we enjoy today are because of, you know, what he, my grandfather and that generation of, of men and women of whiskey makers back during that time held true to during a time where it would have been really easy to say, oh, let's cut corners. You know, we, we can't keep up. We got to make more but they didn't, they, they kept doing it the, the right way. And it's something that they believed in and it's something that he really truly believed in. And so I think it's that, uh, it's not confidence. It's not pride. It's, it's just, it's just that kind of, it's just that knowing of what we do here in Lynchburg and, and the families, you know, that the, there's so many families here at Jack Daniels that have generations of employees here um, you know, I'm just lucky to be one of them. And, um, you know, I could tell you, you know, to, to kind of speak for the people of Lynchburg right now, it's just what we do. Um, you know, we don't have a lot here in Lynchburg. There's not a lot going on, um, but we're really good at doing one thing. 
And, you know, that is what he ingrained in me, I think is the best way to explain it. We do have one question for you from Graham Frazier over in the UK. Any plans for new styles of Jack Daniels bottlings? He loves the higher proof ones. And we had a question earlier today whether you might try to take Jack back up to 45% pr uh, ABV or 90 proof. <laughs> I know that's not your call, but uh, <laughs> officially, but uh, what can we expect to see down the road here soon? Yeah, you, you guys are putting me on the spot quick. Uh, I love it. Uh, you know, I, what I can tell you, you know, what I was talking to earlier, I think certainly what we've seen in in the world of american whiskey over the past you know call it 10 15 years is this shift towards you know high proof and more barrel character right more more color um you know you know more complexity and and, and layers of wood and things like that and i think absolutely with what you've seen in our barrel strength single barrel um you know it, it gets really no i mean we can have we can have exit proofs that hit 140 or even above. Now that's rare, um, but it does happen from time to time. I mean, and that's that's above distillation proof. You know, we just dis we distill at 140 um, or 70%. Um, and so, you know, to have that true single barrel experience that also varies completely from barrel to barrel by proof or ABV, um, you know, you are truly getting the experience then of being able to walk down a rick in our barrel house and sample different barrels. Um, and so we're conscious of that. We're listening to that. And, um, you know, we are going to have, you know, more innovation coming down the line over the next year to, to two years that I think, you know, um, in taking in this feedback, people are going to be very excited. I know I'm very excited. Um, and so there's going to be there's going to be some really great things to come. Uh, but, you know, the focus, you know, as as it's going to have to always still be, um, you know, the flavor, the consistency of old number seven, the quality of our single barrels, our Gentleman Jack products, our other products um, are always going to still be, you know, right there as well. Well, Chris, like I said before, your granddad would be very proud of this day to have you follow in his footsteps as master distiller. It's a shame that it was just a few months uh, short when he passed, but yeah. uh Thank you for joining us today. Congratulations, and I uh, hope to get down to Lynchburg and see you one of these days soon. Well, thanks so much. I hope everybody is, is staying safe out there. Thanks for having me, and I, I look forward to, to chatting with you all soon again in the future. Okay, thank you very much, Chris Fletcher, for joining us, the new master distiller at Jack Daniels. Now let's bring in our other guests. That uh, I apologize for putting you guys on hold. We had uh, committed to taking Chris off the top of the hour to free up his time because he's got other interviews to do and a full schedule. So uh, I had to jump in there, and I apologize for that. Let's reintroduce our guests. On the upper left, core upper right corner, next to me, you'll see Mark Watt and Kate Watt of Watt Whiskey, Adam Polanski, Nora Ganley Ryder of uh, Lost Lantern down below them, and Greg Dillon, whose wife, Kirsty Dillon at Great Drams, is uh, a bit under the weather tonight, so she's not going to be able to join us. Guys, thank you for your patience on there, and uh, let's go ahead and continue with Adam and Nora with your story of uh, developing Lost Lantern. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as I have been saying before, I was at Whiskey Advocate and I used to work at Astor Wines and we ultimately decided that there was no reason that there shouldn't be independent bottling in the United States too. And really our um, our model for Lost Lantern is very influenced by Scotch whiskey bottlers. Like we are deeply committed to transparency, to like finding unique and interesting casks and just getting them out there in the way that whiskey lovers want them. Um, and we're really focusing on the small distilleries from all around the country that have opened in the United States in the last 20 years. Um, there are people who get great casks from Kentucky and Tennessee and Indiana already, um, but we wanted to explore a little more widely and uh, find some really fun stuff. And we think we've done that with our first few releases. Yes, and we're doing both single casts and blends. Um, we have single casts being announced next week and um, our first blend was announced yesterday. So excited to be here. Let's talk about that because you pulled together several distilleries that one would not expect would have all cooperated on this one. Um, some of the big names in American single malt jumped in on this. Tell us about it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, like I've been saying before, we started our, um, our company with an eight month road trip around the country, visiting distilleries, talking to them in person, telling them what we're doing and why we wanted to do it. And uh, 
one of the things that kept coming out from that as we visited these distilleries, especially these single malt distilleries, is a lot of these distillers wanted to play around with blending. They've blended their own whiskeys extensively, but they haven't necessarily been able to do that with anyone else's. So for our first release, we really wanted to do something special and celebratory. So we actually got the distillers and blenders from all six of the distilleries in the blend in one room together with hand-selected barrel samples. We all created our own blends over the course of a very long and very intense day and uh, tasted all of each other's blends and then voted on our <clears> favorite. And the only rule was everyone's blend had to use at least one barrel from every distillery because um, everyone in that group makes great whiskey. And uh, we just really wanted to showcase what American single malt can be when you bring these flavors together. Yeah, and it was fun and collaborative and there was no tension whatsoever. And it ended up being two casks, luckily for us from a logistical perspective, two casks from each distillery. And it truly is a full range from peated single malt to finished single malt to mesquite smoke single malt. Um, and we think it's a really interesting vision into the, the landscape of American single malt currently across many different geographic locations and many different styles. And we think it comes together really nicely. And we've got a question for you from Donner Pass Whiskey. Are your releases cask strength, uh, non-chill filtered and no caramel? Um, so all of our whiskeys will always be non-chill filtered and natural color. Um, most of our cask strength, our single casks so far are all cask strength. Our blend is actually at 105 because we, we tasted it at several different proofs and thought that it showed best at that point. We figured 105 still gives you some nice strength to it. And we, um, we actually got a lot of value in slow proofing it down over the course of four months. We slowly added water to it and that really allowed the flavors to, to integrate nicely um, and brought the edges together. So we were really excited how that turned out, but for non-chill filtering, we're, we're never going to do that. We want to, we're well, here as we want to show off the whiskey the way that whiskey nerds want it. Well, before we get to Kate and Mark, we did have a, the usual question from Bob Wedding. What are you pouring tonight? So what do you guys have in your glasses? And we'll start with you, Adam and Nora. What do you have? And then we'll go around to Greg and then Kate and Mark. So this is our American Bad and Malt edition number one. Can we can we show you the bottle too? We of course. <laughs> I'll hold it well. So this is our I, okay. first release. We're both drinking this. Yeah. This is the very first release from Lost Link. And one thing we are very, very excited about is all the distillery names are on the front label and on the back in, label. In this foil um, right there, it says all of the distilleries and, hmm. and we're committed to doing that for all of our releases is saying who it comes from because for us, the exciting thing is the distilleries we're working with, not really us as much. We just like bringing forward those really cool things and blending them or releasing them as single casks. Yeah. Okay, Greg, what's in your glass? Uh, by the way, that sounds really cool, by the way. I'm going to have to try that. That sounds like an awesome process as well, guys. Nicely done. Uh, in mine, I'm actually on our very own uh, Christmas series special release for this year. Only 150 bottles of it released. Similarly, all of ours, non-chill filtered, natural color. Uh, we play about with the ABV slightly, so ours are normally either at 48.2 uh, if they're a single cask or 46.2 ABV, that is. Um, if it is a uh, uh, one of our blended cask series, um, and using one of my new red Glen Can glasses, which I'm oh, you have one of the red ones. Yeah, I, like I have not seen those over here yet. I have to uh, try one of those. So we can let Kate and Mark talk. Uh, just for the record, I uh, went into the cabinet and pulled out a, a dusty bottle of Middleton Very Rare, the 2011 release. Uh, just because I hadn't opened it and it's been sitting in the back shelf for a bit. So I thought we'd have a little fun with that one tonight. So Kate and Mark, let's get to you guys. Uh, tell us about working for many, many years in the industry and then deciding to go off on your own in the past year or so with Watt Whiskey. And then what you've got in your glass too. Yeah. First of all, slight warning. We have a four-month-old that normally sleeps all night. But is no really, crying. No crying. So I might need to. <laughs> we might need to take it in turns. Um, to no problems. One, important question first. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm on our Kalila 11 year old. And I'm on our Manic Moore 12 year old. So this is our range behind us. Kate, can we see that Manic Moore for a second? Can you hold that up? No, you're. you're okay, because that. No, because that doesn't look nearly as dark as the usual Manic Moors we hear about. 
Yeah, Unf funny that. Unfortunately, we didn't have access to a unique chatting process. <laughs> <laughs> I have to explain, if you've ever had the infamous Loch Do, the really dark whiskey, it came from Manicmore. And I'm yeah. not sure what the hell they did to that thing, but it it is about the darkest whiskey you will ever get. So if you see a light-colored Manic Mark going, wait a second, that's out of character. <laughs> okay, go ahead, guys. I'm sorry. It's all good. When you go, I'm going to go and check on Screaming Child. Yeah. Um, Mark can I think fill you in. Joe, Joe's just um, getting annoyed because we did the, um, the Whiskey Exchange show uh, booths for the last week, and... Uh, she got to be on screen quite often, so at four months old, she's already complaining. But yeah, it's uh, it's been a just seen Bob there saying love the transparency. That's something we're all about as well. We probably are coming at it slightly different from the the other uh, two, and some brilliant stuff that they do. I'm looking forward to uh, trying Nora and Adam stuff. Uh, what am I trying to say here? Yeah, we've been in industry for twenty years each plus. Um, I was two independent bottlers, um, Duncan Taylor, obviously, and at Cadden Heads. And Kate was at Springbank, which is just over there, and then up at Glen Fartless, so two family-owned uh, distillery companies as well. And then in the last year, we, I was Cadden Heads and I parted company, and uh, we, we went our separate ways, which was good. And I thought, right, I want to stay in Campbelltown because I love Campbelltown, uh, and I want to stay in the whiskey industry. Um, and unless Glen Scotia was going to give me a job, um, then there's nothing else to do. Um, so we kind of came up with the idea, looked at some numbers and thought, we've got the contacts, we've done it for 20 years, let's um, have a bash at it ourselves and see how it goes. And first releases came out last week, so it's uh, the start, just to... Start of the journey, so it's uh, yeah, it's it's been strange um, because it's only now that the bottles are in our hand that it's really became real for me. Um, because for you know years I've bought casks, bottled casks, selected casks, you know, sold things occasionally, um, and so doing what I was doing was just what I've always done, except having to worry that it's our own money rather than someone else's. Um, so it's it's now beginning to sink in that it's real, uh, which, yeah, yeah, it's fun. And that makes it more challenging when it's your own money behind this business as opposed to spending somebody else's. Uh, when you have a house to put forward in the house payments and you've got to make the payments regardless of uh, whether your whiskeys sell or not, that's a challenge, isn't it? And I'll pose that to all three of you, to all of you. Yeah. It, it certainly is. I think anyone that, you know, when uh, there's been a few people have seen me since we started out on our own and the uh, the old bar bills are a lot lower than the, the than, than they normally are when it's somebody else's credit card bill. When you start going, hmm, I have to sell six bottles of whiskey to pay for that or I need to, or, or more as the case normally is. Um, so it's, but it's it sharpens the brain quite a lot. It certainly does. Yeah, it'd be Greg, a bit different next time we bump into each other in Shanghai, eh, Mark? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and for us, I think the I, I also massive congrats to you, by the way, uh, both of you. The um, the new release is super exciting. Love the labels and love what you're doing with it. Um, been meaning to tell you for a while, so this is the perfect time to do it. Um, for me, I think it got real um, slightly before having them in my hand. Actually, it was when the first duty bill came through. That was when it's like, oh dear. God, what have we done? And um, then, uh, then, then you kind of rationalise it and spreadsheet the hell out of it. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's certainly different. I, my background's in branding and brand strategy uh, as a career. I've been doing that for about 14, 15 years, something like that. And so it was kind of a natural progression along, I guess, with a passion for whiskey and um, and creating all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it's it's super fun and. The amount of new indie bottlers that are popping up in Scotch, obviously you guys in America now, in Ireland, everywhere really, is it makes it a lot more exciting for everyone, especially as it's an industry that's quite collegiate and we all work together. Like if anyone's got a question, you just ask. Like there's no, if someone asks me a question, I always answer. Uh, probably too much detail sometimes, but I will always answer as uh, the best of my ability. And it's pretty much how the whole industry works. Like Douglas Lang, the big, massive indie bottlers, 
they helped us out massively when we started with all my stupid questions. And they didn't have to, not one bit. They weren't doing anything commercially for us. They just aren't, were nice people. So that's that's a lovely re kind of affirmation of being in an awesome industry as well. Well, I think it's it's great seeing that that's the same on the other side of the pond with you, with your dealing with the American distilleries. Um, and it's it does show you, you know, there is a real camaraderie amongst thieves. Um, you know, it's uh, people people will help each other out when for no real benefit or, but it's just if it's getting more people drinking whiskey, it's good for everyone. Question to uh, post to all three of you, and uh, Nora and Adam, this may be harder for you because uh, since you're just getting started in this and you've been working with distilleries, but how hard with the American distilleries, how hard is it to source casks right now? Because that's what we've been hearing out of the independent bottling business for the last several years is with whiskey demand growing, the distillers want to keep that stock for themselves instead of selling it off. How hard has it been for you guys to source casks? So I think for us, the difficulty is not really the access to the casks. It's the fact that a lot of distillers of here have never done it. So it's a lot of explaining logistics and convincing them that this is something worth doing. But we've gotten amazing buy-in, especially from single malt producers who understand the model and in many ways see independent bottling as the next frontier and a sign of a maturing industry. Um, but by and large, we found some really good things and and people are really open to talking to us and and starting to work with us. So we I think it's I think it's different here just because there's so many distilleries with so many whiskeys out there that we have a lot more to choose from and we're inventing kind of things as we go, which is more of the difficulty for us. That's the fun thing is making it up as you go along. We've been doing that for years around here. So <laughs> Greg, how hard has it been for you guys to source casks? How hard was it for you in the early days? No, it actually wasn't. Um, I think it depends on your volumes, I guess. For bigger indie bottlers, uh, like I'm guessing SMWS, Caddenheads, the Douglas Lang chaps, they're, you know, they're, they're going to be sourcing in such volumes. They actually probably have more filling programs and filling kind of contracts in place. Whereas for us, we only ever buy one cask of each thing that we, we get, right? So we've got a policy of never repeating any of our releases. So when it sells out, it will never happen again. We're not creating a batch two of anything ever. Um, mostly because it keeps interesting for me, selfishly. Um, but we've had feedback from uh, from a lot of our kind of alpha customers, the, the ones that kind of have bought in from the beginning and have been with us for a while. We've got a lovely kind of swell of those guys. We've got awesome people. Um, that They love that it's different every single time. Um, and we, we generally have access to about four to 500 different casks on any given day, really. If we want something, we can have a look at mega spreadsheets and <laughs> work out what, what's interesting and what may work in the portfolio. Other times we take a punt, like you guys were just saying, we just take a punt and see that, I don't know, we haven't had one of them or we haven't seen one of them. Um, let's have it. So we bought Port Dundas from, I see a ghost or dead distillery um, a couple of years ago um, without sampling it, without really thinking about it from when the email came in saying it was a fail of minutes from reading to paying for it. Um, because I like, well, we we may never get the chance to have a dead distillery cask again. I want that. And at absolute worst, I want that. And then it turned out to be a lovely release. So we, we released it and, and then it sold out as about an hour ago, really. Enough. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it all kind of works quite nicely in, in its own wonderful way. Mark, you guys did a crowdfunding campaign to get started. Bob Wenting said, I loved that. It gets you involved as an enthusiast. Uh, hopefully you won't have to do it more often, but Bob's asking if you have any plans on doing it more often. No, hopefully it, you won't need to if this is a success. It was it was a one-off thing to get this started. Um, being honest, I was always dead against crowdfunders and things. It's like, ah, people should just use their own money until I had to use my own money, um, which I didn't have enough of. Um, so we we did a we did a bottling for, uh, for a crowdfunder which was amazing. We sold it off before we'd even picked what the cask was, but we pre-sold it and thinking we'd maybe sell fifty bottles or something just to give us that head start to pay that duty bill. Um, and uh, you know we sold two hundred and fifty bottles in three days, uh, which was crazy. Um, and it's you know it's that helped us move forward. Um, it's one of the things that's helped us start with five casks to begin with rather than, you know, a couple of casks 
and it's allowed us to buy some more casks for for the future um for future releases um so that's it's it's really helped and also like you know being honest it's helped grow the team the you know we've got 250 ambassadors out there um, before we've even bottled anything which is you know i was going to say you can't buy that kind of support but in the opposite of buying the support they pay you to support you um you, you can't really make it up but it's yeah it's that 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 really made made a difference and it given us a lot of confidence for moving forward for for taking uh to, for buying more casks so to come back to the cask point of view buying casks is easy um buying the right ones at the right price is a difficult thing you know as greg says uh, i think the last three months i've been offered well over two thousand casks you know there's no shortage of casks for sale in fact I'm sure Greg will agree that the market's opening up. There's more and more stuff coming. A lot of it's the same stuff. Um, but when you're starting off, you know, it's we're only looking at doing maybe 20 casks a year, so keep it fairly small. So it's easy to bottle something different every time. Um, if you're a bigger company, it becomes more difficult when you're bottling 50, you know. What, what, what I used to bottle at Caddenheads in a, in a month is what I'm looking to do in a year now. Um so unfortunately i'm doing it for about a month's worth of pay and <laughs> compared to what i used to get but it's uh no it's um so it is it's different ways of looking at things that there are casks you've got to be very careful there's a lot of maybe sharks out there that are selling casks that they maybe don't necessarily own they're selling it on behalf of someone else who's selling it on behalf of someone else and so on um i mean i've been offered the same cask by four different people um at sometimes like there's one cask that I, i'm not going to go into complete figures but i got offered it by one person and i got offered it by someone else at five times the price of you know um so you know you've got to you've got to know what you're doing um there's there's a lot of people who probably get caught out with that kind of thing if they you know you get excited oh here's a cast list i'll go and buy one and then you work out the numbers um so it's 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 totally different you know i'd love to have done what, what you guys did and went round distilleries and bought that doesn't happen in scotland really i mean we will buy direct from a couple of people uh generally because we we know them personally very well but it's that you're not going to drive up to our bag and go hey let's <laughs> in we'll pick a cask while we're here you know um so I think uh, you guys are very lucky on on that respect. That there's, there's benefits to both both uh, businesses. You know, if you're not having to go through brokers, etc., and going direct, it's uh, it's a lot more fun probably that way. But yeah, it's 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 it is what it is. It's, uh, We've got a good question here from Pete Head. I'm going to re rewrite the question a little bit because Adam and Nora, you guys are U.S. based, and I'm assuming that for now you're going to stick to the U.S. market. But uh, Greg and Mark, I'm assuming that at some point, I'm not 100% sure if you guys are exporting to the U.S. or not, or if you're going to, if that's in the future and down the road at some, but let's explain where you're, where each of your whiskeys are going to be available. Sure. So on our side, uh, we're predominantly UK and Europe, um, but we can ship to the States. That's absolutely fine. Uh, we've got a specialist shipper in place for that who handles all the, all the U.S.-based custom situations um, and um, and then we have similarly we have specialist shippers for, for most places now apart from Canada they seem to be a real challenge um, <laughs> but we're uh, 2020 was actually billed for us as our in in the business plan as the uh, the year that we hit export hard <laughs> and then and that delightful <laughs> COVID-19 went and hit us hard really and um, so we, we've had to kind of just put a, a plaster over that for, for a while um, yeah, within the next year, we will be exporting to several places. Um, with the US, annoyingly, it comes down to tariffs if we're going to yeah. do that in a big way. Um, otherwise, it can be, that's not an issue at all. Um, but yeah, as a, in terms of a US specific release or something like that, uh, the way that we're set up currently, <clears throat> that can't quite work. Um, but um, Asia, yes. Mark, yeah, we're we're starting small. Um, we are in UK, so 
So we'll be through the whiskey exchange. Um, and then that's uh, Kate just saying the bottle's ready, so I'll grab that in a second. Um, not for me, I've, I've got my <laughs> bottle. Um, so we, we in the UK, predominantly through the whiskey exchange and a little bit locally. Um, and then Japan, Taiwan, Belgium and Denmark. Um, all, all people I've worked with for years. Um, we didn't want to go too big by spreading ourselves too thin, try to make sure there's enough going into each market. We will, obviously the first release has sold amazingly well. Uh, things will die down because, you know, everyone wants the first one. They want the shiny new thing and then they forget about it. Um, so once things die down a little bit, we may look at other markets. We've, we have been approached by people uh, to import our stuff in America, um, which we will do at some point in the future. Um, but it is trickier because you have to have to do single casks just for America. Um, and if we can get that, then we'll be fine. But we're, we're trying not to, I'd rather do less countries, but do them well than, you know, it, it's it would be easy to start the business and go, right, we'll be in 20 markets, no problem, or 30 markets, but you're selling two cases in each market. Is it really worth it? By the time you, you know, you, by the time you fly over to meet your importer, you've already lost all your money. Um, so it's, you know, it's kind of takes the romance out of everything a little bit. That's one of the things about the industry I do a lot, but um, it's, you know, Never say never to anything, but start small and build up. We're not looking to take over the world, but there's always ways of getting stuff into America. I know the whiskey exchange sell there, so uh, once it actually gets online, that is. <laughs> you know, so, Adam, Nora, what are your plans for world domination? <laughs> I mean, like, like these other two, we're focusing somewhat small. I mean, the interesting thing for us in the U.S. is every state is a totally different market, which is a fun thing to wrap our heads around. But yeah, we're focusing primarily primarily on the US and actually our first releases are all being sold online. We had initially planned to release in May in New York and California, but the world changed. And so we're doing an online release only, but the, the really exciting thing is that actually means that we're gonna be able to ship to 40 states. So we will be able to get to many more people in a different way, um, but it gives access to people that may not get to California and New York often. So we're, we're excited about that. But for now, trying to dominate the US before we move on to the world. And people can order through lostlanternwhiskey.com? Yes, yes. And that's live next week. Yep. Now, Let's turn to, well, we've got a comment from Bob Wending here. Greg, is that your attic bar? He loves it. Um, uh, it's, yeah, it's actually um, uh, the upstairs in my office. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the stipulations for moving north from our, my, I'm born and bred West Londoner myself. Uh, one of the uh, stipulations for moving north out of the capital uh, was that we had a room dedicated to whiskey. Um, and so I got it. And that behind me, oh, trying to work out, in reverse. That is the archive of all of our releases over in that corner. They have one bottle, same bottle for every single release, uh, the 20CR and the full size, and um, even the private ones. Yeah, they're quite cool. And Stuart Robertson wishing Martin, Mark and Kate all the best for the future, an amazing adventure that will run and run. Uh, thank you for passing that along, Stuart. Uh, Stuart, some guy, I'll tell you. <laughs> He's distilled a good drop or two in his time. So... This is going to be a tricky question, especially since Kate's in the other room and Kirsty's under the weather. And my <laughs> boss is in Tennessee tonight taking care of a sick aunt after surgery. What's it like working with your spouse? Who's going to go first? And let's go uh, with the newlyweds first because Adam and Nora just got married in June. So you guys are still in the congrats. honeymoon phase yet. Yeah. Congrats. Thank you. Yeah. Um, getting married during COVID, an interesting <laughs> undertaking. Um, but I think you can add to this, but I'll start. I mean, there, there are benefits and there are drawbacks. The benefit for us was that we could take an eight month road trip where we could say we're leaving and we're going to go do this. I can't imagine doing that if I wasn't. It wasn't my partner, my romantic partner, in addition to my business partner. So we were able to put everything in storage and go on the road and come back when it made sense and buy whiskey along the way. I mean, the hard thing is there's not 
as much of a separation between work and home life. It kind of all spills together. And so we find ourselves working at 10 p.m. kind of as things come up. And so there's less less of a work-life balance, but I guess that's true of all entrepreneurs anyway, whether or not you're doing it with your romantic partner or not. Yeah. It's tough to leave work at work when you can't leave your house and your your partner is also your your business partner. And when you have to work in the same room together, right? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Greg, how about you and Kirsty? No, it's actually worked out pretty well, actually, because we've got we've both got marketing backgrounds. So me, as I said earlier, in branding and strategy, uh, Kirsty with all right, direct marketing and uh, kind of building brands. Um, so we've got quite complementary skills that neither of us can do the other one's kind of previous career so to speak not in a, a good way anyway like in, in a proficient way uh, we're quite specialists in what we do so there's not really any arguments over that um what we've always been good at since we very first since the very first time we got together actually was playing to our strengths so even even domestically like curse is an amazing cook so she rocks the food side anything liquid based i can do like cocktails down to tea whatever that's kind of my bag um and and we've always just kind of as a kind of joking way we always use that as an example but we normally kind of split everything towards who is better at it you do it um instead of like faffing around and, and screwing it up um and so Kirst joined the company in so i started it and then she joined the company about four years ago i think or three years ago just after our first son was born um and it's actually worked surprisingly well we don't we we've never really argued anyway i genuinely do mean that we never really are that kind of um, that kind of couple that does that. Um, normally, because she's right, obviously. But the um, the at the end of the day, it's uh, it, it's something that we both want it to work. We both want to win at it in in our own kind of small way. So we make it work by um, handling the things that we can do. And if neither of us are great at it, then we'll work out which one of us is, or toss a coin, or whatever. But it's um, one of those things. So when it comes down to actually creating, if we do blended casts, for example, I'll create the recipes for them. I'll choose the casts. I'll do the pilots, all of that. Then Kirsty, because obviously she has a much better palate and nose, as, as is probably obvious. But the she'll come in and make sure that the flavors are right, and make sure that it is. Like she'll effectively sign it off pre-production. And when it comes to the single casks, again, I'll choose the casks. Um, but then it has to go through both of us. To agree, and if we, if one of us says that's amazing, and one of us said mm, not so sure, then we shove it back in the warehouse and, and go with something else until we're both absolutely massive big tick, um, and then then things happen. So it's actually worked in quite a complementary way from our side, I think. Mark, you and Kate both have long histories in Scotch whiskey. How did you, when you decided to start working together, how hard was it to uh, make it work? Um. Well, we've not made it work yet, that's for sure. But um, no, um, the working together thing's really surprised me at how we haven't killed each other. Um, it's actually been a lot easier than, than I thought. When when I was working at uh, Cadden Heads and you know Kate was uh, was was down here at home, you know, we we always said we'll never work together. Absolutely, we could never work together. We would just murder each other. Um, and but I think it was always that if we were like if if I went to work for Glenn Fartless when she was there or what uh, like we would have been intruding on someone else's patch, so to speak, or like one of us would have been the more senior and that would have been wrong. Um and I don't think that would have worked. Um whereas this we've actually got on really well. You know, um I've been at home since November, so it's like and then, you know, coming into the COVID and lockdown and, you know, Kate was pregnant with, with Joe through it all. And it's it's all worked really well. But, you know, like Greg said, we both take different things. I'm, Kate's actually much better on the whiskey side of things and the, the, the tastings and all that kind of thing than she gives herself credit for. She's a much, um, she's much bigger geek than she lets on. Um, just because she's not as big a geek as I am, um, she kind of she kind of thinks, oh, she doesn't know that. But we've kind of got an agreement that when it comes to the whiskey side of thing, or you know, the, the rums as well, whatever. When it comes to final selection, I get final choice, unless she's adamant that 
no, we shouldn't do that. But, so she gets final choice. It's her choice <laughs> to uh, complain but, or not. But the thing is, like, she's got a very good palate. We've got very similar palates. Um, so therefore, you know, it's unlikely. I can't see there ever been a time where um, where I would pick something and it was horrible. Um, that and, Well, hopefully not. But that, that Kate would think was horrible, if that makes sense. We both might think it's great and everyone else thinks it's horrible, but hopefully not. Um, but it's, and then Kate's much better at the creative side of things, the branding, the, the being nice to people, the, um, the like logistical side of things. Cause that's been, that's been one of the biggest changes for us. Uh, I've, I've always worked for independent bottlers that have had their own bottling hall and their own warehouses. You want a sample, you just go to the warehouse and get it. You, you know, you want something bottled, it just gets done, you know, and, Logistics, it's, it's easy. What, what we found the hardest thing about starting an independent bottom is dealing with couriers to get things moved. You know, we, we, we work with Claxtons, they're, they're great guys, they do our bottlings for us, but they're up in Dumfries. So we're moving things from the middle of nowhere to the end of nowhere. And <laughs> no courier company really wants to do that. Or so, But it, it's those things that have been important. I've just seen how wonderful it is working with you, dear. <laughs> I was oh, now, wait a second, because while you were talking, I saw Adam and Nora pointing at each other. <laughs> explain, um, explain this. This was when, when I was saying that he was the nice one, the one that could go, could be nice to people. And that's Adam in our, I'm the, I'm the, I'm bad cop and he's good cop. Um, yep. I've heard that before. <laughs> yeah. At our house, I'm good cop and the boss is bad cop. <laughs> Yeah, and we for us it's interesting hearing how you select whiskey because for us it's we both have to say yes to every single cask, and if one of us says no, we don't get that cask, and that's been really difficult because there are times where we go through tastings of twelve casks, and we both walk away and we go, there is one cask that we're absolutely going to buy. You you're going to know which one it is, and then the other person thinks the exact same thing, and they're different casks. And then we end up not buying something from this distillery that we both love. So that's been <laughs> that's been an interesting thing for us to get used to as a couple and as a business as well. Yeah. So Kate, let's get your perspective since you were away taking care of the baby for a few minutes. Let's yeah. get your perspective on working with Mark. Well, he's out of the room, so I can say anything I want. <laughs> that's what he did. Um, <laughs> it's actually been all right. I thought we might kill each other, but so far. That's what he so said. Far, yeah. Um, it's quite good. We both kind of bring different things to the business. So I think that stops it getting too fraught. Um, Mark's very much the kind of cask selection side. Like he gets final say on the whiskies. We did, like, we both tried them and we both agreed what to bottle. But if there was something that he really wanted to bottle and I was a bit kind of nah about, then he would get final say. But I get final say on the more creative stuff, so the kind of design side, that kind of bit of it. It's worked so far, but it's early days. But he says your palate is better than you let on or that you like to let on, and that uh, you're you're more of a geek about this stuff than you like to admit to. Possibly. I always say he's the geek, but I think, yeah, there is a bit of it in me as well. It's not necessarily a bad thing, though. No. So, good question here from Graham Frazier. Do you use store casks and let them continue to mature, or do you buy and bottle them straight away? Um, from our point of view, we're just starting out, so we buy them and bottle them straight away. We don't have the cash flow or the funds to lay stuff down at the minute. Um, we'd love to, but that's for kind of further down the line. So at the minute, I mean, we'll maybe hold on to it for six months, a year, but we want to be buying things that are ready to bottle, certainly at this stage in the business. Greg? Yeah, from, from our side, we, uh, a mixture of both, actually. Uh, we specifically, we don't really buy a new make spirit. Uh, we always buy mature spirit, um, apart from one by accident, because I didn't read the form. <laughs> um the uh but the seriously thankfully it turns three in december so we're all good um but yeah that we actually we do a mix uh so quite a few of the casts that we own we've actually bought specifically to just lay down and use for various different things 
Um, because we also do like private bowling. So like sometimes people want to do a small run for like a birthday or a corporate gift or bespoke labels, that kind of thing. So we have specific casks or portions of casks for that. Um, and others like the Port Dundas bought it knowing that within two years, as soon as it hit 10, it was going to be at the right flavor profile that I wanted for that. And boom, we bottle it. Um, one, we actually had a, weirdly enough, I was just tidying up just before we started here, trying to get rid of all the old sample bottles. Our uh, Ben Rick, um, who we did uh, beginning of last year, um, we bought it at five years old and we bottled it like three weeks later. And because as soon as I tasted it, and like, even though that's five, that is exactly what I wanted from our first smoky whiskey. And that toffee note and all that other stuff that went with it was just knockout. So I was like, why the hell am I waiting? Let's just do this. Um, and then a couple bought knowing that um, I would be um, finishing them or we would be finishing them in certain casks. So we bought a Craig Ellicky that was a first fill ex bourbon. It was 10 years old, um, sorry, 10 and a half years old and had a an Oloroso cask, uh, sherry cask made specifically for it because there's a specific amount of liquid or spirit in that cask. And I was like, I want it to just fit because I don't know why, but I want that. And so we did it and um, and it worked amazingly well. Um, and occasionally we do, I just saw a question come up from Bob there. Occasionally we do do bottlings for whiskey clubs and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, we, we're quite flexible in what we can do. Um, and we can like do all kinds of crazy stuff. So yeah, we bought some, very rare that we buy it and then bottle it um, like immediately, uh, maybe a few months or a year later, absolutely. Um, but then others are being laid down for ages. Like that 30 year old that we talked about earlier, um, that we bought a while back and, and then it ticked over to 30, then still waited eight months to bottle it. Um, and then we've kept hold of a very small amount of that. It's just aged through just because of curiosity and um and maybe for the staff of two christmas party one day we'll have a, a drama there but, yeah you have to have more than two people to have a staff though to have a staff christmas party <laughs> we, to be fair, we, we actually have we now have a third member of the team uh, who is awesome and uh yeah so there'll be three of us socially distanced obviously um <laughs> we'll be in uh one end of the bar and, and he'll be in the other end of the bar it's fine <laughs> Kate, we have a question for you from Whiskey Boy, um, and this was for Mark, but we'll ask it to you. Okay. He'd like a hint on which distillery was used for the Highland 10-year-old and which distilleries you used in the 19-year blended malt. I know you're not going to tell us, but uh, can you give us hints? So the Highland 10-year, it was one of those ones that you buy and you're not allowed to use the distillery name. So I can't tell you what it is. It I would not be a distillery that you worked with previously, right? No, no. Okay. George doesn't like me that much. What? I'm saying George doesn't like me that much. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying because, yeah, because we know you worked for Glenn Farkless. We know yeah. George does not let anybody use the distillery name. So let's just knock that one out right now. It wasn't yeah, a Glenn no, Farkless. Definitely not that. Further north. <laughs> Further north. Northern Highlands. Somewhere around okay. Sutherland kind of area. <laughs> 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 Um, so yeah. What about that blended malt? The blended malt, we don't actually know exactly what's in it because we bought it ready blended. Okay. I can tell you it's all ex Edrington stock. So make of that what you will. Um, we're assuming some kind of McAllen, Glenrothes type stuff, whatever it is, it's that really lovely kind of sherry Speyside style that's coming through in it. Um, if we did know exactly, we would tell you, but that one, as I say, because it's bought ready blended, um, Mark would love to start doing his own blends at some point, but again, that's for a bit further down the line. Who's the better blender, you or Mark? To be honest, I've never done it before, so I don't know. Okay. That's um, fair. He did quite a bit at Cadden Heads. I've never done any blending before, so maybe we'll need to have a wee competition at some point. <laughs> We have a fun question from Bob Wenting at uh, Malt Stock. So being independent bottlers, what would be the most relaxed whiskey to be able to bottle? And of course, Malt Stock is the relaxing whiskey weekend in the Netherlands, usually each September, not this year because of COVID, but that's why he's asking the question. So what would you like to blend or what would you like to be able to bottle if you could? What would be the one that would make you happiest? 
silence from the panel here. <laughs> I don't have anything. <laughs> um, that's that's the fun thing is because no one in America or most distilleries in America haven't done this before. There's depending who it is, there's a little bit of convincing at first, telling like explaining them the model to them. So we have some people on our wish list that uh, we're needling them a little bit every six months. We're like, hey, do you want to sell us a cask yet? Want to sell us a cask yet? Oh, let's put some pressure on them. Go ahead. Who you who you, What's your wish list here? Oh, we'll all email them. Sorry about it. <laughs> we can put some pressure on them. <laughs> no, I have to be very careful and diplomatic, but um, there, there are a lot of great places. And we still, because we only buy from places we visited, that constrains us a little bit. And yeah. we, um, we did a tour of the Midwest. We did most of the Western half of the country. But because of COVID, we haven't been able to go to the Southeast yet. Um, and they're really interesting distilleries in the Carolinas and in, um, in Florida and in Virginia that we just haven't made it to yet. So that's uh, once we can travel again, we'll be getting down there. On the to-do list, yeah. Okay, Greg, what, who would you like to bottle that you haven't yet? I'm literally scanning around the room trying to think. Um, do you know, one, the one, <clears throat> one I desperately wanted when we started this was the Craig Ellicke, and we made it our second release because of that. Um, we, we're pretty good at hunting for uh, casks that, that we want that from distilleries that we love. So pretty much every release we've done has got a connection to either an experience or a passion for that distillery and every single one we've visited in in one form or another um so like similar to you guys like we we make a real real, real deal about that, that that there's a real reason for every single release although it may not be on the label or whatever um i mean if we're going mega wish list which will 100 percent uh never ever ever happen i wouldn't mind a great dram single cask of yamazaki but let's be real um it'd be glorious to do a glen goin um, maybe even do a, sorry, very quickly scanning the office. Uh, maybe even do a Glendronach or an Avalauer as well. They'd be belters to have under our label. Um, again, blue, blue kind of, if anything could happen, an Ardbeg single cask would be glorious, but that ain't happening. <laughs> Unfortunately. You never know. Sadly. You never know. We, we have friends in high places. We can, we can try to help make that happen. I mean. I don't mind playing bad cop CC. once in a while. <laughs> yeah, just make sure you CC me into that email, we cool. We'll work that out. I'm kidding, of course. Uh, Donner Pass Whiskey recently got a Cut Sprite Nebraska single malt, cask strength, unique stuff. Have your guests had their whiskey? I'm going to be honest, I'd never heard of it. So I'm betting they haven't either, but... Uh, We've had it. Yeah. Yep. You have? How is it? We visited them in, uh, in Nebraska, actually. Um, it's good. It's it's strange. It has this like uh, orange creamsicle flavor that I haven't really seen in single malt before. But they actually were one of the very first American distilleries to buy uh, Forsyth stills. So they're using Forsyth stills on the Great Plains. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really interesting stuff. And we uh, we would like to work with them at some point down the road. Okay, I learned something new tonight. I'm gonna have to check these guys out because I had not heard of them. Uh, Obviously, they grow a lot of grain out in Nebraska, so I can imagine that uh, they should be able to make some pretty good whiskey out there. Um, let's see here. What else questions we have? Since uh, we're not going to get the details on that one. Uh, let me ask you, Adam and Nora, how much trouble have you had getting distribution in the States for your debut release next week? I, mean, I think as Nora was saying before, like, COVID has made the whole thing a little strange. Like our original plan had been to, to really focus on the, the big whiskey markets in New York, New Jersey, San Francisco, a little bit in Kentucky. But I mean, no one is going into to whiskey shops anymore. I mean, at least where we are, half of them are still closed and we're in a pretty rural area. Um, so the market is just totally different. But the online avenue um, lets us get it out to a lot more places than we had planned. So that's a... Uh, actually a nice upside much as i wish we could be down there doing the desk side tastings with you and with the other uh media people down in new york so that's uh, one of the parts i'd always really look forward to when we were planning this is being on the other side of the table fun question here from graham frazier if you have to choose pete or a sherry cask or 
personally, I'd go for both. It's the ginger and Marianne question. Yeah, you take them both. I'd take a peated sherry cask. Yeah, like a Lefroy PX. Um, I don't know. I, I personally, I would go sherry cask. I love peat, and I spent most of my 20s drinking peated uh, Scotch whiskey, but nowadays I'm more leaning towards the sherry cask side of life. Kate, what's your preference? Oh, that's a tricky one. Um, like, I, uh, both, but not when they're overdone. <laughs> like, I really like peated whiskey, but not when that's the only thing you can taste. Mm -hmm. And I really like sherry cask, but not when that's the only thing you can taste. So I would probably go refill sherry <laughs> rather than fresh sherry Yeah. And for most things. Um, but if I had to choose one or the other, I would go peated probably. I'm a West Coast girl at heart, so I need that kind of slight smoky peatiness coming through. I, I like that idea because uh, things get uh, – you get too much peat or you get too much sherry or too much wine cask finish, and you don't get the distillery character. And I, I love that answer. Uh, Adam, Nora, what are your, what's your take? For me, it's peat, no question. I, I am a big peat person. And I also, like, personally, I, I like sherry, but I often find it overwhelming for my palate. My palate comes from a wine background, so sometimes those really big flavors can overwhelm me. So, so I'm with you on the, the kind of more subtly flavored um, things coming from sherry or even just peat. But generally, I'm team peat, hands down. And I'm team peat also, but it's probably more extreme peat. Like, I like the peat bombs more than, than she does. Um, you like the face melters. Yes. Yes. <laughs> the, the other fun thing, I don't know if you've got yeah, any. Nice. I know. Yep. Um, we both really like mesquite smoked whiskey too. Um, I don't know if that's any of that has made it over to the UK, but some of the distillers in the Southwest are basically malting their barley by burning mesquite wood under it, either themselves or with one of the big maltsters. And um, we think that can actually be quite subtle and interesting. And it's a, uh, one of the more unique things we've seen in American single malt so far. And one of our first single casks is a mesquite smoked uh, cast strength single malt. Nice. Didn't they did quite well with uh, Wild Turkey and Long Branch with that, actually. That, that's quite a, a reasonable introduction to the mesquite um, way of doing things. I, I quite like that release, actually. And since Mark is back with us, your choice, Pete or, Pete or a peated cask or a sherry cask? Your preference. Neither. They're both rubbish. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I, I obviously was weaned on sherry uh, growing up. I grew up at McAllen. Um, and now I've moved to the West Coast. I should have a bit of peat. But um, it's uh, anything as long as it's in balance that it adds something to it and doesn't overpower the dram. That was kind of my answer, too. <laughs> it's almost like we've rehearsed this. I know. <laughs> but no, um, sometimes there's a time and a place for everything. Um, you know, there's sometimes you want a punch in the face of peat. Sometimes you want a big cherry monster. Other times you want something else. And that's why you have independent bottlers to give you lots of different things to, to, to drink from. Um, you know, as an independent bottler, I think, yes, we could put everything into first full sherry and it would be brilliant and it would sell. But it would just be sherry cask whiskies. And what's the point? You wouldn't be able to tell whether it's a Manic or a Dal Ewan or a Balmenic. It would just be a big sherry bomb. And that's fine to some extent, but just create a sherry whiskey brand rather than yeah. an independent bottling company. Yeah, we have this. Yesterday, it's all about you want the distillery character. We want the distillery character coming through rather than the cask, the cask particularly. We have this comment from, uh, oh, okay, what's his name? That's uh, Pedro Jimenez bar barrels are hyped in my opinion. And that's a controversial opinion because a lot of folks make a big deal out of PX barrels. Um, is PX overrated? <laughs> <laughs> not, not to drink. Um, I love it on vanilla ice cream, man. Yeah. yeah. I, I think Glorious. you've got to be careful with it. Again, a lot of, I'm trying to watch what I'm saying here, um, as always, but it's it's very easy to chuck something into a PX cask for a couple of weeks and it becomes really dark, you know, And but is it integrated? Is it, I don't know, um, a, probably a, a refill PX cask, amazing. Um, it's just what you like, but if you, if you want something that's just overpowered by sherry, slap it in a PX cask and 
you know, yes, it'll sell because everyone likes the dark stuff apart from Loch too. Um, <laughs> just pulling it back there, but um, not for me. That oh, said, Mark, you got to get Kate to bring the little one in here because we got to see this kid. <laughs> We, we love babies around here. So, um, casks and ashes, Sherry Bomb lover here, as is my lovely wife. We both enjoy an occasional foray into a peat monster, though, as well. I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of people that agree with that. Uh, Donner Pass Whiskey, this year with so many fires, the Napa and Sonoma County vineyards in California are so contaminated by the smoke that many will not harvest. Too bad they don't make the wine and market under a different label as smoked wine or Better get distill that stuff into a brandy or a cognac or something like that. We've heard tell that St. George out of Alameda in California is doing some distillation of those smoked grapes. So we're excited to hear more from that. And a great comment for you two from our pal at uh, Iron Root Republic down in Texas, yeah. Robert Licorice. Cheers to the Lost Lantern crew. Can't wait to see them on the market. Yeah. Well, Adam went and grabbed a bottle because... We actually, I don't know if you can see it on the screen. Oh, this is a little can. preview. We actually have an Iron Root cask coming out next week. So yeah. we're psyched. We love their whiskey. They were really excited about this. It's yeah. a corn whiskey. It's a corn whiskey. Oh, and when we visited them, we were not really shopping for corn whiskey. We were looking for bourbon. And uh, we may or may not have found some bourbon there as well. But they <laughs> literally would not let us leave until we tasted this cask of four-year-old corn whiskey. Is this based on their Icarus corn whiskey? I mean, it is, it's a single barrel, so it's... Um, okay. Yeah. Because they had your Icarus, and it's great. Yeah. We, yeah. I don't know what it was earmarked for, but they, they made us taste it, and we went, okay, fine. You're right. We will buy this cask. Yeah. So. Part, of, part of the for us is if you taste something really amazing, you just got to go for it. I think, though, it's, it's great, though, to not to kind of have an open mind and not be... Um, you know, and let other people lead you if that makes sense, or, or take a chance at times and try things. For yeah. for example, the Manic Moor that we bottled was finished for three months in the next brandy cask. I don't use the term finished; I put rested for three months because three months is not a finish; it's not even a start, in my opinion. Um, and if, had I seen on the the list of casks that it was three months in a brandy, but I wouldn't have asked for a sample. But when we started, it's like, oh, Manic Moore, 2008. Brilliant. I'll take a sample of that. It's a hoagie. Got it. Loved it. Thought there's something really great about this. Went and bought the cask. And they were like, oh, actually, there's a problem with that. It's not actually a hoagie. It's two hoggies that's been filled in a brandy butt. And it's like, well, everything we said we wouldn't do, we're just doing straight away. But yeah, <laughs> we liked it. And, you know, it's all about the taste. It's it, that's, that's the main thing. Well, I'm looking over at... Uh... The sample of uh, the Whistle Pig uh, Boss Hog Batch 7 that they sent me that uh, I just tasted. And they rested that thing in a South American teak wood cask for three whole days. So I'm not sure that counts as a finish either under your terms there. <laughs> what do you define a finish as, Mark? If it's not uh, three weeks, what, what does it take? We, we, we were discussing this the other day because we've got some stuff that's been a bit longer. It's like, I wonder when... It where I will define. I think it probably more so will be not on time, but on taste. Mm. You know, if it, the, the influence it's had rather than, you know, you know, saying, oh, well, it's five months and 30 days. It's not, that's arrested, but six months, ping, it's now a finish. Um, you know, we'll just look at each, each bottling on its, on its own merits and, you know, the great thing about being your own boss is you can make up your own rules. That's uh, yeah. great question here, and I'm not sure of the answer. Does St. George age anything in their ex, ex absinthe barrels? We tried a peerless single barrel rye recently that was finished in a Copper and King's ex absinthe barrel, and it makes a great Sazerac. I don't know the answer to that, but I will check with Lance Winters at St. George's and ask that question for you. So we'll try to get an answer for that. Um, but uh, that sounds, I mean, is. Some of these finishes just go off the charts in terms of uh, craziness, uh, in terms of what people are willing to finish something in and take a chance with a perfectly good whiskey and then put it into something that just really craps it up, in my opinion. <laughs> Manuals casks. I hate. Side, we had a, the first time we finished something, 
was our Craig Ellicky sherry cast I mentioned earlier, that 10 and a half year first, first fill bourbon, then six month first fill Oloroso. And um, I was bricking it from, sorry, for American viewers, I was, uh, oh, what's the term? I, I, I was very nervous, very nervous from, from the start of that. As soon as it was filled into the uh, sherry cask, I was petrified that I'd absolutely just destroyed something that was actually already quite lovely. And um, I, normally we get, from our, the cast that we already own in, in, in the warehouse, we get samples down probably three times a year, then maybe slightly more if it's getting towards when I think it's going to be ready to release. And um, with that one, I got really, really obsessed about having a sample like every three weeks, which was needless, really. It didn't change that much in three weeks, obviously. Um, but weirdly enough, now when you can chart it and have all the samples, be like, oh, actually, from a geek level, it was quite cool. Um, and then it actually took until, I think it was at four months, I thought, this is so close to being ready. And it feels like an actual finish. The color was right, the all natural color, obviously. The flavor had actually materially changed, but still got that Craig Ellicky meaty kind of character to it and that thick, oily spirit to it. Um, and then, uh, then it got to five months. I was like, oh, it's so, so close, but I don't want to wreck this. And then at six months, I was like, right, let's just do it. Because I do not want to get to seven and be like, oh, for the love of God, why did I wait? <laughs> um, I it genuinely was just like, this is, I don't want to ruin something that I loved before we started. Um, so th there's also that kind of emotional <laughs> attachment to it when it's your own stuff, you know, because um, that could have really screwed it. Although, as, as I was saying to some people before, uh, before coming on here, the, the last page in the business plan I wrote, was in massive font, um, quite a nice font to be fair, but in massive font, Comic absolute Sans? worst. <laughs> Hell no, Mark, you know, you know my, I'm sure you know my feelings on Comic Sans. I, I wrote a whole kind of thesis on that. Anyway, but the- um, uh, <laughs> I no, couldn't I, resist. Font geek as well. Uh, it was Dino T if it, if it matters. Um, but the, um, uh, the last page read, at absolute worst, we drink it. And that was the, that was the fundamentals of, of the business plan. So, uh, yeah. Ours was at absolute worst. We sell it to someone with lower standards. <laughs> <laughs> nice. nice. Damn, I'm going to have to update the business plan. <laughs> I left this comment up on the screen. Tabitha Adams wants a whiskey finished in Umeshu, uh, Japanese plum wine barrels. If you can find last year's Whistle Pig Boss Hog, uh, the sixth edition, they did put, some, put that in uh, Umeshu barrels. So that's one of them. Um, and Casks and, and Centauri did the opposite and did a run of Umeshu finished in Yamazaki barrels, which I, sounds interesting. Mark, I think St. George did that too. They made their own Umeshu and then finished yeah. some of whiskey in that. For and I think uh, Nanhu have done some, some finishes like with similar things uh, over in Taiwan. Uh, yeah. And Bob Winning asks, plans on bottling other spirits? Mark and Kate, you did a rum from Belize in this first batch, didn't you? Yeah, which is why we need to go with your um, plan of only bottling from distilleries we've visited. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'd love to bottle other stuff. You'd love to bottle other yeah. stuff. We have another cask of rum. We have another cask of rum, which is, which is very nice. Mm -hmm. um, but get whiskey going, a little bit of rum, and then we can moving to cognac, armagnac, anything that's in a cask that's good and yeah. it sticks with the philosophy of natural, non-chill filter, you know, no additives, uh, and price point is right and yeah. we like it. So, Let's start some trouble here. Graham Frazier, question. Some whiskey girls feel that single malt scotch whiskey bottled 30 plus years ago was far better as it was distillate forward. Agree or disagree? I'm staying out that's of that. That's a good question. Let's go for it. <laughs> uh, both agree and disagree. Um, uh, there's big arguments that, that whiskey was better in the past. Unless you invent a time machine and open a bottle that was opened then and one now, yeah, there's going to be variations. Uh, more mm. distillate forward was that because they were using poorer casks, so therefore it had to be distillate forward. Um, but I love distillate forward stuff. You know, I love drinking new make. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I love drinking most things, to be honest. Um, but it's it's one of these things that are they better or were they not? Uh, it's you're not comparing like for like, I don't think. 
I think generally whiskey's more consistent these days. Yep. So yeah, there was probably a lot of distillate forward, really good stuff, but equally there was probably a lot of rubbish 30 years ago as well. Because what you've got to remember is, see most of the stuff that we go to the old and rare shows and things to drink, it's the good stuff that people keep. You know, it's a bit like, I, I start to say, people say music was better in the past, but they only remember the good music from the past. They don't remember all the stuff that, that came out that didn't make it to the charts that no one collected. So, um, yes, I love stuff that was distilled in the 60s and 70s, but that's because it's older. Um, and I grew up drinking that. Mm. So I don't know what you think, Greg. Greg uh, well, from last night, I, I kind of agree with pretty much all of that. The um, One of my favourite whiskies I have in the office is... Um, Bought a couple of cases actually of the old Glenfiddich Pure Malt um, from the very early 70s, like the early stuff, um, at an auction just because I wanted it as usual. And um, and I have to say, it for me, it knocks the socks off the stuff for the let's say the 12 year old that are producing now. But then older Glenfiddichs now are incredible. Like right next to me, there's a, a Glenfiddich 21 year old uh, Grand Reserva, beautiful whiskey, really nice stuff. But you haven't got anything to compare it with from 30 years ago. You only really had one, max two releases from a distillery back then. Really, there was commercially viable. It's like as a, from a volume perspective. So you don't necessarily have the same way of comparing. The what's quite interesting is blends to compare them yeah. 30 yeah. years ago to now. So I have a real weird like uber geek passion of collecting old versions of current whiskies. I do that too. Oh, good man, we need to keep that together <laughs> when, when COVID allows. Um, yeah. So I, I've got a bottle of Johnny Black from every decade since the 30s. Same with Dewar's White Label. Are you not that bad? No, you're not. <laughs> uh, they're all, I'm literally looking at them right now. They're all racked up on that side of the office. He's an and, amateur. Uh, for you. <laughs> it, to be fair, it's only because I like things in a line. Um, Adam, Nora. It's just how we roll. <laughs> Adam, Nora, any thoughts on that? We're going to stay out of uh, old scotch bites, but uh, we agree. <laughs> I, I really like old blends, and I like new blends made in the style of old blends, like some of the uh, the Compass Box releases. Um, and we look like forward to when we can have debates about 30-year-old American whiskey. I'm jealous <laughs> of you with your 10-year-old, 19-year-old whiskeys. Right. And the distilleries we source from, most of them haven't even been around. 10 years or just barely 10 years. Granted, if you're in a place like Texas, I don't know what will be left in a barrel yeah. after 10 years. <laughs> so I'll take this question from Donner Pass Whiskey and rephrase it a little bit because filling a one liter mini barrel with PX Sherry to season it, then we'll start making PX Finish Scotches and things like that. Do you guys have a home blend that you keep at home that's just for yourselves? We've got yeah. two. Yeah, we've got a couple. Um, I, just for playing with it's the like you got me a, a wee cask a few years ago and to be honest i've only really been seasoning it for the last couple of years mm -hmm. i'm going to start probably doing something with it um but yeah it's it's fun but you've got to watch the wood in those small casks it's, particularly if it's in your house uh, it evaporates quickly because you drink it and because of the heat um so yeah it's 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 a bit different. Sorry, I just wanted to jump back to the previous point on the old blended whiskies. Sure. What people say like, oh, uh, a Bell's today is not as good as a Bell's from 20 years ago or 30 years ago. But if you look at the price point of what a bottle of Bell's 30 years cost as, as a proportion of your, your average wage to what a, a Bell's today costs as a proportion of the average wage, you were getting, you were spending a lot, so there was a, there was a lot less malt whiskey. There was more malt whiskey going into it, um, mm -hmm. so the blends were much more the focus of a quality product rather than. I'm not saying they're not a quality product today, but as a cost point, yeah, you were getting much more. You, you were having to pay a lot more for what you got. So, if you look at even Johnny Blue, which came out what early '90s, late '80s, can't remember exactly. Like, I think it was '92, if memory serves. Um, but Johnny Walker Blue. It actually started as Johnny Walker oldest, and that had whiskey that it was actually in its sixties in terms of how old it was. That had some in there, but it was not the youngest. That's what started the whole age statement rule. 
Yeah. But you can only claim the youngest because somebody, uh, James Espy, told me recently, oh, several years ago, because he was the one who came up with this, along with his uh, mm. partner in crime, Tom Jago, at, uh, back at UDV in the day, that Amazing. somebody in marketing decided to start advertising, well, we got 60-year-old whiskey in this thing. That's when all hell broke loose, and the age statement rule went into place that you can only claim the youngest whiskey yeah. in the bottle. Yeah. And um, and from, yeah, so you, you kind of have, that's where the old blends are quite interesting, like to Mark's point there, that they would have had much older stuff in them um, than you'd have now. So if it says 12 on the bottle now, it will be cost and value engineered to be 12 years old, whereas back in the day, it would have been all manner of amazing stuff that they just found and kind of made stuff from, right? Um, but to the question you're asking on, on do we keep, Blends in the house. We like infinity bottles. I'm assuming you kind of mean. Uh, if you can see, I'm trying to work out that finger again. See those dark things there? That's four infinity bottles um, from Ireland, Scotland, America, and then a mass globe, like world one. Um, and they're basically the end, like press samples. When I'm done with reviewing stuff, they all go in there just to kind of uh, create some amalgamation of weirdness. Some of them work, won't lie to you. I've had to balance one or two out before because they turned out to be pretty ropey. But um, yeah, it's good fun though. But you're right, they do evaporate so quickly. We had them in a, a barrel in the office and my God, I, I seasoned the thing, I did it all properly, even read the leaflet, which I never do on anything, um, and then filled it all in. And then over one surprisingly good summer in the Northwest of England, um, the whole bloody thing evaporated. So frustrating. It evaporated because somebody left the bottle open and it got poured out. <laughs> I wish that was the case. I wish sincerely that I'd even had a drop of it. But no, it was gone. It was gone. Well, the angels yeah. loved it then. It did so it smell. must have been good. Yeah, sure. Okay, we've gone in 90 full minutes and plus. So final thoughts. Let's start with you, Greg, because uh, you were here first. Any final thoughts? Tell people where they can find your whiskeys. Uh, so our uh, limited edition Scotch whiskeys are available on greatdrams.com. Um, and they they change frequently. Uh, we're actually the kind of case ends of a few of them at the minute. Um, we've got our Christmas special edition out with, I think, about 24 bottles left. Um, and after that, who knows, we'll be releasing some cool stuff and some virtual tastings. I think there's one next week or the week after uh, for people in the UK and Europe, uh, which will help decide our next release as well. All right, Nick, I'm sorry, Adam and Nora. So our whiskeys should be available next week um, on lostlanternwhiskey.com. Um, but if you want to hear the single cast announcement or see the single cast announcements realistically, follow us on Instagram at Lost Lantern Whiskey or sign up for our newsletter for some exciting news kind of over the next couple of days. Okay, Kate and Mark. When you there? Um, yeah, we've no plans to sell direct. That's too much like hard work. <laughs> um, we in the UK, uh, the whiskey exchange easier than retail. Will be going, uh, and they, they they send everywhere. Um, also, my mate, the whiskey shop, Dufton, and then as I said earlier, we're in Denmark, Taiwan, Japan, uh, Belgium, Belgium. How can I forget the Belgium, the beers? Um, <laughs> and so yeah, so that's the the UK should be going online any day soon, and. You can come to Campbelltown. We've got local stores that, uh, when you can't come to Campbelltown, you can, yeah. you can buy it there. But uh, new things coming out maybe four times a year ish. Yeah. Um, and Jules Whiskey can't wait to get your whiskeys to Australia, Mark and Kate. Whiskey exchange ship. To whiskey show, exchange, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One just final question from Graham Fraser Any U.S. whiskey likely to age to 20 years plus? Yeah, we already have some. Elijah Craig, 21 and 23. Bourbon, sir. Yep. Those have been around for years in limited amounts, but yeah, we've had 20-year-old American whiskeys before. It'll be interesting to see what American single malts get to 20 years and what those taste like. But yeah, we've had uh, American whiskeys that are over 20 years old. So let's call it a night, guys. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I want to thank Mark and Kate Watt. I also want to thank Greg and uh, Kirsty Dillon, and uh, let's hope Kirsty gets to feeling better soon. Also, I want to thank uh, Nora Ganley Roper, Adam Polanski from Lost Lantern Whiskey in the States making its debut next week. And you can follow all these folks on their websites. They've shared their information with you. 
Thanks for joining us tonight. We will uh, be back on Friday night with the Happy Hour webcast at 5 o'clock. Hope you'll join us then. Until we meet again, I'm Mark Gillespie. And for our guests tonight, and thanks again to Chris Fletcher from Jack Daniels for joining us earlier as well. Good night, and we'll see you on Friday. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Cheers. Bye. Cheers.